Good morning, welcome to Highfield Online this morning at 10.30. My name's Helen Thompson and I'm the children's pastor here at Highfield Church. And good morning from me, I'm Mike, I'm the vicar. We've just got a few notices as we begin. Uh, the first is about small groups. Uh, this is a crucial way to belong to the church for mutual support and for prayer and encouragement. Uh, if you're in one, that's brilliant. If you're not and you'd like to be, then please let us know. We also realise that maybe some of the prayer sixes, which worked brilliantly in lockdown one, might have fizzled out during the, the time, the rest of the year when we were released from captivity. If you want to be put back into a prayer six or maybe you want to pick up with one, that would be great as well. Again, let us know. The Alva course is on week three. This week we have got 16 participants, so we would love it if you could keep each of those 16 people in your thoughts and prayers this week and the team as they continue. Uh, also, uh, this Wednesday is our monthly student night online. It begins at half seven uh, with half an hour of catching up with uh, friends and meeting uh, new folk in, in the ministry. And at eight o'clock, we have a time of worship, a talk, and hopefully some ministry as well. So please be praying for that if you're not a student. And if you are a student, please come along and invite your friends. Today, after the service at 11.30, whenever the service has ended, we have Zoom coffee. So please come and join us for a chance to just relax, chat, and connect with one another over coffee. You have to bring your own. Um, the link is in the description, and it's also in the e-news. And if you're new to Highfield Church today, it's your first time, welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. And if you'd like to find out more, we would love to connect with you too. And you can fill in a link underneath the YouTube description today to fill out a connect card and we can tell you lots more of what's going on. Let's, let's pause. And as we begin our, our worship together, let's just remember God's presence with us. And in a moment or two, uh, I'll say a prayer. So let's pause and remember God's presence with us where we are wherever we're listening, wherever we're participating in this this morning. It's an opportunity now uh, just to pray. Welcome God's presence by his spirit into your home, your household, into your life. Let's pause. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence in so many ways. Thank you for your love shown us on the cross. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us now. Please help us to worship you. Help us to hear your word. Help us to engage with you in song and in prayers. And Lord, may we know your blessing this day, we pray, and in the days and weeks ahead. Amen. Amen. And now Rhiannon and Sam are going to lead us in worship.
and doubts they can all come to because they can't say Lord when I'm here with you and it's a new to a time of prayer and we're going to say sorry to God this week for the things that we've done wrong so you're going to need your bodies we're going to do our mimed confession so first of all we wash our eyes and as we come before God we say sorry God for the things that we've looked at or seen this week that weren't good and for those things we are sorry we wash our ears and say sorry for the things that we've heard or listened to this week that weren't good or of you. And for those things, we are sorry. We wash our mouths for the times that we've said cross words or angry words or we've said things that we don't mean. Father God, for those things that we have said, we are sorry. We wash our minds for the things that we've thought that were mean or not good, for those things. We are sorry. And we're going to wash our hearts for the times that we've felt things that were not good or of you. And for those things, God, we are sorry. And we're going to wash our hands and hang them out to dry and say, Father God, for the things that we've done wrong this week that weren't of you, we are sorry. Help us to live clean this week for you. Amen. And now we're going to join our church family for some prayers. Father God, we um, just lift up the health service at this time. Um, Father, those on the front line, the, the doctors and nurses and on the ITU and uh, on the wards, just dealing with the very sickest of patients. And I lift up a, a colleague of ours um, who is currently in ITU. Just pray your blessing on them and your healing at this time. Father, we lift up all of the volunteers who are helping in the effort against COVID and thank you for their volunteering. Um, we just pray that you would bless them and sustain them at this time. Um, Father God, we thank you that the numbers are levelled and starting to come down now. And would you do pray as new variants appear, um, we just ask that the spread of these would be limited and that people would um, show good community spirit by obeying social distancing rules and just that we can prevent the further spread of this. 
Father God, I pray for a real sense of community in the effort against COVID. And also lift up all those who have had their elective surgeries cancelled. We pray especially for those uh, with cancer that are having their treatments delayed and the stress that this is causing to them and their families. Father, I just pray for your blessing on all those involved in healthcare at this difficult time. Just sustain them and bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Father, we bring before you all those involved in our schools. Thank you for the resilience of our children and young adults who are missing friends and routine. We know that many are anxious about missed work and about exams. Help them to keep doing their best and trust that you have a plan for them. Thank you for all the parents who are trying to juggle homeschooling and work. We ask that you give them the peace they need to balance these conflicting demands placed upon them. Thank you for all the school staff, teachers and support staff who continue to do all they can to educate and keep safe the children and young adults in their care, whether in school or at home. We ask you to give them the energy and imagination to carry on. And thank you for all those in school leadership who have faced challenges they could never have imagined and risen to them. We ask that you guide them to the correct decisions for all in their schools. Lord, keep all these people safe in your hands. Amen. Father God, we just want to lift up uh, student generation to you uh, who understandably feel like the forgotten generation. We pray for the 2.3 million uh, students who are currently enrolled across uh, the UK at universities and we pray particularly for their mental health. Lord, as much as there is a pandemic going on, there's always been an epidemic surrounding mental health. We pray for your mighty hand to be over students in this time of great disappointment and apathy great apathy that can also turn uh, into many dark places. And we pray against those dark places. We pray against addiction in all its kinds. We ask, Lord, that you provide uh, the right water to drink from, friendship, community. And we pray uh, for student well-being in the confidence of knowing that you are God, our Father, who keeps his promises, who heals and restores. We also turn our attention to the academic support and support staff at both Southampton and Solent University. Keep them close to your heart, Lord. Although our campuses may feel and seem deserted, you don't desert the ones who, uh, who work there day by day, physically or virtually. It must feel incredibly isolating, Lord. And so I pray that your presence would be with those who are working, both from building to building, but also home from home. And finally, Lord, we pray for uh, student pastors and student ministries across the UK. We pray that you would give those leading the right inspiration, the courage and the strength to keep supporting and uplifting students in their faith. We pray for the 0.78% of students who have faith, and we pray that this statistic would increase uh, during this time of hard pressing. Give opportunities to every student in our community, uh, in our country, to experience the love of you and the power of your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Father, I pray for all in our community at Highfield who join us every week from across the world, the country and the city. I pray for us to be a generous community, reflective of your love for us to one another. Help us to bear one another's burdens, to be attentive to each other's needs, and in so doing, bring your kingdom on earth. Amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Today's reading is from Philippians 1, verse 27 to 30. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Good morning. Great to be with you this morning. My name is Pete Hutchings. I'm the associate pastor here at Highfield Church, and thanks to Becky for our reading. We're carrying on our series in Philippians. When I was about nine or ten, I used to love taking my bike to a bit of undeveloped land, which was just off a roundabout, about half a mile from my house and opposite the church I went to. It was great for bike riding, with narrow tracks formed by the passage of numerous feet and cycle tyres over the years. Most appealing to a young boy in his bike were the small mounds or hillocks, which were easy to cycle up and then great for whizzing down the other side. It was also a popular place to walk your dog. And on this particular Saturday morning, as I was out riding my bike, there was also a man walking four dogs, two large Alsatians and two smaller dogs. I don't recall the sequence of events, but I do remember very excited dogs, which seemed a little out of control. I know they made me nervous and somewhat fearful. One of the Alsatians came bounding up to me and jumping up, caught me with one of its teeth just under, above my eye. And if we're ever allowed close enough to one another again, you can see the teeth marks here. There was quite a lot of blood, and I remember my dad being very cross with the dog owner, who had followed me home to explain what had happened. What I learned that day, where dogs were concerned, was that I needed to stand still and show no fear. I must confess that of all dogs, and I do like dogs, especially Labradors, Alsatians are still the one breed that caused me some uneasiness. As we're going to see in our passage this morning, Paul is urging the Philippian believers to stand firm, to face things, and to show no fear. Paul's purpose in writing the letters to the Philippians was to express his affection for them, his gratitude to them for their gift and their partnership in the gospel, and also to address a number of pastoral issues. And in our journey through his letter so far, Paul has reassured the Philippians as to his own welfare, and that despite his circumstances, he's been able to continue his ministry and witness. And it's most likely that Paul was physically chained to a guard and I find myself both amused and challenged by the thought of Paul seeing every guard shift change as an opportunity to share Christ with a new listener who couldn't escape. Paul tells his readers of his own struggles and how he's facing up to them. Four times he mentions being in prison in Rome for the gospel. He points to the possibility of his death and states that he's ready to die for the truth. And now as we turn to the final verses of chapter 1, Paul turns his attention to his concerns for the Philippians. He begins verse 27 with, whatever happens, and his meaning is clear, whatever happens to me, whether I live or die, whether I'm able to come and see you again, whatever, regardless of my situation, here is what is important. Here is what I want you to do. You are too. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So what will this involve the Philippians in doing? Let me suggest three things that Paul wants them to do. He wants them to stand apart from the world, to stand together 
with one another and to stand firm against opposition. Now, before we go any further, it's important we should remind ourselves of the context of the Philippian church. Philippi had a privileged status as a Roman colony, one of only five cities in Macedonia granted the right to be governed by Roman law and to be exempt from direct taxation. The Philippians would have enjoyed Roman citizenship and been fully aware of the rights that this gave them. The phrase, conduct yourselves, translates as a single Greek verb, polytuomai, that appears only in the New Testament in two places, here in verse 27 and also in Acts 23. In both places, it refers to one's conduct as a citizen. And Paul is using the very familiar context of citizenship to remind his readers that the most important conduct is to behave in a manner befitting citizens of the kingdom of God. They were to stand apart from the expectations of their society. The Philippian Christians must have stuck out like a sore thumb. They weren't willing to participate in the popular cult of the Roman emperor, nor were they willing to follow some of the funeral rites and obsession with ancestors that would have been the norm in Philippi. This wouldn't have made them popular with government officials or unbelieving family members. And both groups would have viewed them as bad citizens, a cause for shame to both city and family. With his challenge to live as citizens who are worthy of the Christian gospel, Paul is telling the Philippians that they are citizens of another heavenly country, as he reminds them in chapter 3. And he should take, they should take their sense of shame and honour from it, rather than from Philippi. And in this world, Christians are strangers and foreigners, fully involved in it, but not of it. And you may recall us exploring the same concept in our journey through 1 Peter before Christmas. So first of all, Paul wants the Philippians to stand together with one another. One of the ways in which the Philippians can demonstrate their heavenly citizenship is, as Paul puts it, to stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Now, whether Paul's referring to our human spirit or the Holy Spirit, there's an implicit reminder that all believers are filled with the same spirit of God, the spirit that wants to grow in all of us through the ages, the same fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, there were clearly problems within the church in Philippi. And as we shall discover in the following chapters, there were those who were looking after themselves to the detriment of others. There were false teachers who claimed that salvation required trust in Jesus and adherence to Jewish traditions. And there were two women whose disagreement had reached such epic proportions which cannot have been good for the rest of the church, that Paul publicly names and shames them in chapter 4. It must have been one serious argument. Just as we would be most reluctant to join a household where COVID-19 was raging, it's difficult to see how the sickness of disunity and disagreement in the Philippian church could prove attractive to those outside it. And Paul also encourages the Philippians to stand firm against opposition. Once again, as Mike has talked about previously, we have the imagery of a soldier standing firm, not being swayed by the tide of battle, and supporting and being supported by those on either side of him. Not giving in, because to do so would impact not only himself, but those around him as well. We don't know any details of what opposition the Philippians were facing, but Paul's mention in verse 30 of the same struggle you saw I had may well suggest that others, like Paul and Silas, had been beaten and thrown into prison. The word granted in verse 29 comes from the Greek term charis, often translated gift. And Paul tells the Philippians that their faith in Christ is a gift, in the sense that Jesus was and is God's gift to humankind. 
and that suffering for Christ is also a give, gift. Maybe not so welcome, but a gift nonetheless. James reminds us that it's when we face difficulties, when our faith is put to the test, as hard as it may seem at the time, that God is growing and maturing us. He writes in chapter 1 of his letter, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The truth is that we learn more in valley experiences than on the mountaintops, because hardship teaches us more about the nature and faithfulness of our God. So then, how should we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? What does that look like in Highfield, in Southampton, in the midst of lockdown three? Paul talks of defending the gospel in verse 7, chapter 1, of proclaiming the gospel in verse 14. And perhaps even more importantly, he challenges the Philippians to live the gospel to stand apart by their very conduct. The challenge is just as real for us today. Not only to be different, to be set apart, but to be genuine in doing so. Probably one of the greatest hindrances to the advance of the gospel has been the inconsistency of Christians. The gospel has its greatest influence when the lives of Christians commend it. And that places on us, on you and me, a huge responsibility. Paul says that it shouldn't matter to the Philippians whether he is there with them in person or not. They should live consistent lives, lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. The same is true for you and me. Whoever we're with, whatever the situation we face, we should behave in the same way as if Paul or Jesus himself were stood beside us. It's no bad thing to reflect on what would Jesus do or say in any given situation. He calls us to be salt and light in our world. Salt to act as a preservative, to counteract the moral decay and corruption in our world, whatever that mo might look like in the workplace or community. And light to act as a beacon of hope, of a different way of looking at things, and ultimately, as a light that points to Christ. What does being salt and light mean for you in your circumstances? As Paul challenged the Philippians to stand together, what does that look like for us? And it should go without saying that if there is disunity and disagreement amongst us, we need to address it. Our focus needs to be on how we can serve one another and do community. And if ever we needed to understand fully what being a community means, it's now. How can we be more effective in caring for one another and those around us? I know that there are many who are doing as much as they can, as much as is allowed, to support others. Many of those people, but not all by any stretch, are part of our pastoral team, who do such a great job often unseen, but hugely appreciated. Thank you to everyone who's stepping out to be family, to be community, to others. But the challenge is there for all of us, particularly in the midst of lockdown once again. Who is God putting on your heart? Whose day could you make by a simple phone call or sending an email or text? I'll confess that I'm not brilliant at listening to God's prompting, but I am learning that he sometimes brings people to mind so that I can at least pray for them and sometimes do more. If the church family can help, whether pastorally or practically, we're here. If we can pray for you, we count it as a privilege. Contact details for pastoral help, practical help, or the prayer line are in our e-news and below this video stream as well. One other way in which we can stand together and be community, is to join the call from the archbishops to pray at six o'clock each evening from tomorrow onwards, from the 1st of February. And then finally, what does standing firm against opposition look like for you and me? 
When we commit to follow Christ, we commit our life to him and for him and in obedience. And in doing so, we put ourselves in direct opposition to the ways of our world and the evil that exists in it. We paint a target on ourselves as people who are seeking to live to a different set of values and a moral code that's often contrary to the ways of our world. Opposition will come in many forms, both obvious and more subtle. But there will be opposition. For some in our world, the opposition will be clear and take the form of overt discrimination and persecution. Perhaps for those of us in the West who live with religious tolerance and freedom to worship, the opposition is still there. But it's perhaps more devious and insidious, with a constant pressure to conform as the pull of the world tries to distract us from the things of Christ, or as the world tries to squeeze us into its mould. One form that opposition can intake that impacts on us at the moment is the circumstances that we find ourselves in with lockdown and the additional pressures that that brings. Perhaps the challenge for us, therefore, particularly at the moment, is not only to be resilient in our circumstances, but also in our faith. I wonder what that might look like. In the teaching session we had this week with the discipleship student, year students, we looked at what it means to be resilient in our faith. We considered a number of key aspects, which are spiritual factors, but I was most struck by gratitude. I was intrigued to read of a substantial body of research which has been conducted to explore the consequences of gratitude. For example, in one study, participants were randomly assigned to one of three groups and given a weekly task to do for 10 weeks. One group was asked to describe five things that they were grateful for that week. Another group was asked to describe five hassles they'd experienced in the week. And the third group was asked to simply list five events that had happened to them in the week. At the end of the 10 weeks, participants in the gratitude group reported feeling better about their lives as a whole and being more optimistic about the future than the other two groups. They also reported fewer symptoms of physical illness than the other groups. I know there is much that is difficult, and I won't pretend that I don't have it easy in comparison to some of you and others in our wider community. I have much that I can be grateful for. Please do take a moment to think about what you can be grateful for. Now, of course, you don't have to be a Christian to practice, Christ to practice gratitude. But we do recognise, as Christ's followers, that we have so much to be thankful for. Not least, that in all that we face, he stands with us and walks alongside us. Amen. Helen. Thank you, Pete, for those really big challenges. For some of us, they'll be bigger. For others, they won't. But I just want to encourage you just to take a moment or two to reflect on Pete's challenges about how are you going to be salt and light this week in the community around you? And how are you going to be community when we're all told to stay at home? And how are you going to be resilient and practice that gratitude and that thanksgiving for all that we have? And as you reflect on that, Rhiannon and Sam are going to lead us in some worship. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. 
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. as we continue to worship together that amazing chorus of I will build my life 
upon this love. It is a firm foundation. And the invitation in what Pete was sharing with us to stand apart, to stand together and to stand firm. Just in whatever context you are, maybe you would like to stand, maybe you'd like to kneel. If you're with family members or household, you might want to lay hands on one another. You might just want to lay a hand on your heart. And let's pray. Let's pray now in all the contexts in which we find ourselves. We pray, Father, that you will give us the strength to stand, whether it's to stand apart and be different, whether it's the strength to stand together with friends within Highfield or Christian friends across the country, whether it's the courage to stand firm. Please come by your Holy Spirit. Come to our homes, our bedrooms, wherever we're watching this, with whoever we're watching this. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Remember earlier on in Philippians 1 that it's our prayers for one another and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ that gives us sufficient courage, sufficient courage for this time. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Give us the strength to stand apart, to stand together, and to stand firm in our faith. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. And just as we continue to pray, if you know that you're struggling, maybe uh, ask someone to pray for you who's physically present or a friend uh, in our fellowship to pray for you. Just come, Holy Spirit, we pray. May your perfect love drive out our fear at this time. May the peace of your presence settle in us and between us. If you know the, the Lord's touching you, just continue to pray. But I believe we've got one final song. Say 
So as we prepare to close our uh, service, uh, remember the Zoom coffee afterwards. It's an opportunity just to connect with people. Uh, we'll put you into small groups so it won't be an investigation in front of the whole church. It'll just be a chat with eight to ten people. So it's a real opportunity uh, to connect with folk at the end of our service. But we're going into the week ahead. And we're going into the week ahead confident in God's presence and full of gratitude for all that he has done and all that he is doing for us. So in that spirit, I pray, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you are, in whatever context, be with you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>